I want to thank Chip for um, asking me to do this. Um, I've had the pleasure of working mostly as a peer with Chip for the last many years. Uh, this boss thing is very temporary. Uh, and had the pleasure of watching him apply critical thinking to the op operation of, of IT at our university. And it's been great to watch, and I've learned a lot from him. So when we first talked about this presentation, it was in the context of the potential for an April presentation, kind of don't be an April Fool sort of thing. and talking about some of the various cyber scams and cyber crimes I see at the university and, um, and what folks can do about it. It's still June, but uh, the problems are still there. So uh, who am I? Well, other than what I've already said, I've been in IT since the early 1980s. I've been in charge of security at the University of Maryland since 2002. And, uh, my responsibilities include a wide variety of things, including my office provides support for the victims of computer crimes that occur using university resources. So we have you know, a community of 50, 60,000 people between the faculty, staff, and the students. They have email accounts, they have network access. And in, on a fairly regular basis, we have people walking through our doors because something bad has happened to them. And many of the stories here today that I'm going to show you are ones that we've seen before. Um, so we will get rolling on that. So I like to always start out these things by talking about the bad guys and who they are. <laughs> Once upon a time, hacker was a good word, sort of. The hackers were the guys that explored boundaries, looked for ways to do things. This, of course, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, who actually were on both sides of the fence. They were. Hackers back in the days when you hacked phone systems and you'd build little boxes that made the little dial tone tones so that you could fool the system into making long distance calls. 1960s, 1970s, that was your hacker and they were just kind of those folks that no one else understood that were off in the corner. Time rolls on in the 80s, that's kind of the era of the teenager who no one pays attention to. He's got computer stuff he hides in the basement. <laughs> The exploitations we see in the 80s are very much geared towards the mind of an adolescent, even though some of them are in their 20s or 50s or 60s. Uh, <laughs> ego, it, it's all about ego. Most of the early viruses we saw, they wanted you to know you were infected. You'd get a skull and crossbones laughing at you as your disk drive slowly disappeared, um, followed by a little brought to you by and whatever their cool computer handle was. Um, so. Hacking in the 80s was all ego, and that's what it was. Then the wall fell. Um, the 1990s really saw a spike in the creation of malware, viruses, worms, and all of that. And many of the creators of those viruses could be found behind the wall. With the fall of the wall, with the collapse of the Eastern European economies, there was this large population of smart, college-educated computer scientists who suddenly couldn't find work. And what do you do when you need money and there's nothing else to do? You go with what you know what to do. And so we started seeing the first viruses that involved actually people making money, going out, finding credit cards, finding information that they could monetize and use to maintain a lifestyle. If people are making money, sooner or later, the Sopranos and their uh, brethren around the world figure out that that's going on. And so as we turn from the 20th to the 21st century, crime took no big crime took notice, and we started seeing syndicates become involved in the computer crime industry. The kids who previously had been freelancing, working for themselves, now were employees of a much larger machine. The machine gave them better technology to do their jobs, give them access to better resources so that they can get out onto the internet. And in exchange for that, you know, they're paid handsomely to generate profits for the family, so to speak. As we move late into the 2000s, 2008, 2009, we start to see the trend now where all of those different organized families are shrinking into a smaller number. We're seeing consolidation into large crime corporations, if you will. Crime, a lot of the things you get from 
hacking and those sorts of things can be monetized. There are black markets. There are gray markets. There are complicated websites set up so that you can sell and trade information taken from people's computers. Um, credit card numbers, that sort of thing, you know, they're traded like commodities. So it's a really big business. The latest turn in this now, and don't want to pick on the central Chinese army, but uh, that was the first picture of uh, hackers in uniforms I could find today. They could be from just about any major country in the world. They're all engaged in it these days. Cyber warfare is a part of um, you know, the landscape. Stuxnet was a virus that came out, uh, we heard about two years ago. The feds recently came out and admitted that the U.S. and Israel worked together on this virus that was targeted to get into Iranian nuclear research facilities to destroy their centrifuges. Okay, the, that's kind of using you know, the cyberspace for gaining an advantage. The anonymous crowd, they've discovered that many people around the world, many organizations, many government organizations are sloppy with their data and there's all sorts of stuff out there that I guess folks like you would probably want to know about that, that kind of you know, prove the things you suspect about government in some cases. Um, some cases just embarrass organizations, people. But the anonymous group has taken hacking and brought it into the political world to try and drive a political agenda. And it just keeps going on from there. So what are they after? Well, the obvious one is dollars. Um, and we've gone over that already. Everything they can get that they can sell, credit card numbers, that sort of thing. Fingerprint, that's my kind of icon for identity. Identities are big business. Those same markets can trade $3 a head if you've got a good social security number and can prove that it's useful. Even higher for youngsters' social security numbers. See, if you have a social security number that's valid but has never really been used for credit check or anything like that, bad guys can come along and basically slap any name and any birth date on it because the people who verify this information don't actually have access into the Social Security Administration to see what matches up. All they know is they don't have credit records out there that they can access that say who they are. So, what was it, 10 years ago, eight years ago, something like that, folks were told they had to get Social Security numbers for their kids, and maybe a little more than 10 because my son was 12 now, and that was kind of new then. So children have Social Security numbers. They don't really need them for the first 18, 20 years, so they start getting jobs. Schools starting to require that information. They're trying to keep track of people. Social Security numbers have always been the best way to keep track of people, even though federal law says you can't use Social Security numbers for anything other than Social Security. University of Maryland, it was your student ID number for about 50 years, which has prob been problematic for me in my day job because, well, when I started in 1981 at the university as a freshman engineering student, the first thing I saw was a sheet of Social Security numbers and um, sign-ups next to it for folks to arrange for orientation sessions. And I said, wow, look, there's somebody with a Social Security number. It's just almost the same as mine. But they were just out there everywhere. We posted grades with them. Eventually, okay, we're only going to show the last four digits of the Social Security number, but you know, the first three digits are about where you were born, and the middle digits are kind of zeroing in on that. So actually, fairly little piece of the Social Security number that's random is the part at the end that everyone uses because they don't want to use the part that's so common. Um, so we've spent the last 10 years trying to flesh out and destroy what's left of Social Security numbers on our campus, but faculty being faculty, and no offense, sir, um, like they hang on to things. Old grade books with social numbers, we, we still find them on a regular basis and try to get them out of people's hands before um, somebody else gets them. The university has been lucky that we haven't had that big incident. You know, Berkeley, for instance, they lost alumni records for over a million people a couple of years ago. You could, there are probably 100 universities that have had a big hit like that. Well, like I said, we had, did have one incident about three years ago where we had 30,000 leaks of one. Somebody screwed up and put social security numbers on mailing labels for mailing from the Department of Parking. So we disclosed social security numbers to everyone's mailmen, unfortunately. We still took it seriously. We still provided credit monitoring all that because you just never know. Uh, but they're big money. Um, the computer. The, the guy down the bottom there, the laptop, that's more representative of just your computer. 
your computer is just as valuable as everything else. And the bad guys love to use your computer because that means they're not using their computer to commit badness. It's kind of the modern day analogy to the old getaway car for the gangsters robbing the bank. If I can hack from your computer instead of mine, I'm a little safer. For the past 12, 13 years, we've had these things called bots floating around. Bots are little computer viruses that get into your computer for the sole purpose of letting somebody else take over your computer when you least expect it and uh, do things from your computer, preferably without you knowing it, because if you know about it, you're going to get it fixed. But if you don't know about it, you may leave it there for years. Um, so what, what's the bad guy going to do with your computer? Well, for one, sending spam is very popular. Um, the, you know, we, we've all seen spam and we've gotten tired of it and the internet providers we have try to stop it. And one of the ways they stop it is to blacklist the network addresses of the folks who generate spam. So the people who do spam for a living to try to make money need new computers in order to continue getting past those things. And so a fresh computer out in the suburbs of Maryland is, is the perfect thing for them to do their work. They also, and we'll talk more about this later, they can also be used as weapons, especially if you happen to have a number of these computers at your command, and typically they are traded actually, like commodities also, groups of a thousand bots, or you know, even more sometimes, have them all do something to the same website at the same time so that it doesn't work anymore. And we're gonna talk a lot more about that later on. The last little picture there is uh, Indiana Jones' warehouse there at the end of the movie, which I use to represent just the vast amount of data that just is lying around relatively unprotected on the internet that somebody else could use for some purpose, uh, whether that's governments, whether that's corporations, whether that's personal. So spoke a little bit. Phishing, for those that haven't heard, is a form of spam in which you're tr trying to be fooled into providing your information to someone who is trying to get your information. At the university, this was a gigantic problem two or three years ago. Um, a, couple, a couple days wouldn't go by without an email message coming in claiming to be from the university saying, hi, you need to change your password. We've had a security incident. Well, we were about to have one, yeah. Um, <laughs> and you'd click the link provided. It'd say, click here to go to the mail site. They would throw up a screen with uh, the logo of the university, the logo of the IT department, and login and password. And in the course of four months, in the spring of 2009, over 1,000 people did so. Boom. Um, and immediately, as soon as they would do that, someone somewhere overseas, we figured it was overseas, and that's kind of where we're not able to follow it anymore, would start using their email account to send those messages to people at other universities. They would use some percentage of what they'd captured for this purpose to keep getting more and more victims. They'd keep a small set on the side so they could use that for their own purposes, because account on a university computer, that could be really cool. They've got big networks, they've got big servers, they could do lots of cool stuff. And potentially they've got good data too. Student and in personal information, grades, security numbers, financial information, we've got all sorts of good stuff. Um, we did some um, analysis of the victims. That was kind of interesting and it kind of followed through on a thought that it had for a long time which is that the youngins of today are far more uh, cynical than their elders. Um, and, and the numbers were so frighteningly linear that I, I, I had to pay attention to them. But we had a certain number of our freshmen who fell victim. Almost exactly double that number of sophomores fell victim. Almost exactly double that number of juniors were victims. Double that number of seniors and then if you take all of our graduate students combined, that number was double what the uh, seniors had. So it was like, wow, that's cool. So I said, well, what happens when I start looking at the faculty and the staff? <laughs> <laughs> they destroyed my nice, beautiful model, but uh, suffice to say, there were far more of them than there were of the students. And, um, and actually, it did kind of break down by age. That, that uh, I think. Say, I guess folks who grew up in, in, in nicer times or more trusting of people, perhaps, uh, I could draw other conclusions, but uh, it, that was pretty interesting. Now, there's another form of phishing called spear phishing, 
which is really scary. And we've seen reports of this uh, in the news. You okay? Yeah, we've seen reports of this in the news lately where um, somebody targets a specific person and crafts these messages to overcome uh, their, their thoughts that this may be a crooked message. They go online, learn whatever they can about the person. They may impersonate that person's boss because there's an org chart. They may impersonate Joe from HR because they can see, okay, most companies like to post pictures and bios of their corporate officers, so there's lots of good stuff out there. And so, ooh, you got this message from HR. It says you got to do this. They take care of that. They happen to be a corporate officer. They've turned over passwords to get into special accounts of the corporation. And then the bad guys come in, freeload the information, depending on their agenda, post it for all the world to see, use it for espionage, industrial espionage, what have you. I heard a new word today when I was looking around called whaling, which I guess is taking this to its ultimate goal for fishing, the spear fishing, the whaling. And that's when you target major public officials. Um, we saw, I believe, my mind is suddenly blanking on the political candidate who fell victim to this, one of the women. It was Sarah, yeah. Um, that, that's, a, that's a pretty good example of whaling where you know, she was fooled into uh, giving out information that allowed folks to get into her Yahoo and other things and read all her messages. So it goes. My job is to try to get people to pay attention to what they're doing online because usually when you're not paying attention, that's when bad things happen. I've taught for years, if you have a web browser, it has a little line at the top that tells you the address of the website you're going to. If suddenly you think you're going to Citibank and the line at the top says Citibank.ru for Russia, Maybe you're not on the same website. Um, but uh, the folks who invented these guys, these are QR codes. They make life easy for you. You just point your smartphone at them, and your smartphone automatically takes you to the web page, so you don't need to think about them. What does QR mean? You know? Oh, never mind. Quick response. Thank you. What? Quick response. Quick response. Thank you very much. Um, the, I mean, they're great. Especially if folks use smartphones, I don't know about you, but I have a tough time typing those things. My finger's far bigger than the little buttons on the smartphone. Mm -hmm. But I just snap the picture and I go off to the website. Suddenly we've taken away that information. Most of the programs just take you there. And on smartphones in particular, the amount of information available for you to verify what you're doing is limited because you don't have that much screen space and they want to present the web page, not extraneous information. And so you could easily be taken to a website that is introducing a virus into your smartphone or is leading you off again someplace where you're not really where you think you were. Um, the close cousin to this is um, we're seeing a lot of websites these days that take advantage of web shortening services. I want to take you to a very specific site in my organizational website. It's about this long. I don't want you to type all of this in. So instead, I give you there are several services, bit.ly. My favorite is terps, T-E-R.ps, um, for weird reasons. But that you, you enter a long URL into one of those services, and it gives you a very, very small one that you can easily type. And it does the same thing to the poor person who's reading it. I've taught you all along, pay attention to where you're going, and now you're going to this gobbledygook. And you don't know if it's legit or not. So one has to follow. Sometimes things flash on the screen quick. It makes it difficult for folks to pay attention to where they've gone. It makes the job of being vigilant that much harder. I have some examples of um, what the FBI the FBI partners with the National White Crime Computing Center to run an organization called IC3, which is just simply the Internet Crimes, Internet Computer Crimes Center. They are a clearinghouse for incident reports, victims of different online scams, internet things, all goes into this um, site where they try to make sense out of what's happening and, and figure out what's bad and so forth, and issue information on uh, how to protect oneself from whatever is up and coming. So many of these come from last month, IC3 published their latest annual report on cyber scam um, trends. The scary thing is many of the things they're saying, I go looking back, the web is a wonderful thing, you can look backwards, 2008, 2006, many of the same things were still there. 
we've got a kind of modern twist on some of it. The new technology, new kind of web marketing ideas, but the theme is pretty much the same as it always was. So it's called the online auto auction scam, but it's also, it could just as easily be anything, big dollar auctions with eBay or Craigslist or anything that involves the buying and selling online of items with people you don't know. Um, in these scams, uh, somebody offers to sell you the car, a car at a very low price. You know what? I just kind of flipped that around. You're selling the car. Okay, same deal, but you're selling the car. I'm getting my scams mixed up. There's so many of them. But the bottom line is they're sending you a partial check for the payment of the auto that you're, you've sold on an online auction. But once it clears, then we'll send you the rest. Here's a check for the shipping. You cash that, and then you'll be able to pay to ship the car overseas. Except the check is bogus. You cash it. You, I mean, you go to the bank, you cash it. It's bogus. It bounces. By the time it bounces, your stuff has gone overseas. And... Um, and then you wind up losing the money. You've got to pay the bank back for the money. You use that money to ship the car. And then so you're out on two ends. Ah, nothing a scammer loves more than vulnerable people. And who's more vulnerable than those who are lonely? In the romance scams, you put out there on some sort of social site that you're interested in meeting people. Someone from overseas responds, thinks everything you say is funny. They, they send you pictures and say, wow, why is somebody that attractive interested in me? <laughs> um, and they put a lot of energy into building a relationship with somebody who is dying to be wanted. And then the sob story starts. Um, our family is in poverty. Father's in the hospital mother's off the wagon, we need to feed the kids, can you send me a little money? Oh, sure, it's not, you're not asking me for $20, $30, $50, you wire them the money. Then the problems get worse, we're behind on the rent, and before folks know it, you know, they, they've channeled large amounts of money because they want to believe that this is all real. IC3 reported that they get a romance scam victim reported to them on the average of five or six a day, with an average loss of $8,900. So it's like, people really want to believe. <laughs> so how many people have seen this on the side of the road or have gotten an email message? Email processors needed. Earn $25 for each email you process. Do 30 a day and get $750 a day of guaranteed income. Guaranteed. Um, and you think, wow, email, that's got to, got to be easy. I could, I could do more than 30. It's, it's, it's awesome. Flexible, no minimums, work when you want. No. Who wouldn't want to? The catch is many of these are actually from criminal organizations looking to find mules, people who will launder their money for them. They send them bogus money. I mean, they send them ill-gotten money, rather. You send it into the economy. You take money back. You send off money. You're part of the whole money laundering effort. And these emails are just all about you know, clearing financial uh, arrangements. The downsides, aside from the fact that generally, because they're employing you, You've given them personal identifiable information about yourself because they're your employer, because you know they're going to file with the IRS to make sure that your W-2 comes in on time. Also, um, when the you know, law enforcement gets smart to the scam, who's the person pushing the buttons? It's you. So it, it, it's kind of on a couple different axes. It's out there for people to uh, get bitten. That was a good one. This was even better. It's got Google's logo on it. It's got to be legit, right? No experience necessary. Earn Google cash. So all they're saying, all you got to do is visit websites, and Google will pay you. All you have to do is fill out the form. Uh, the instant feedback. You qualify. Wow, I qualify. Everybody qualifies. Start making more money from home. Click here now. 
boom, hey, she's got cash. Now, it's got to be real. And there's a check there that looks oh so googly. If you can get up close, you can see, yeah, not really. People go for this stuff. They have to pay for the starter kit, shipping and handling. Um, you know, wow, you're going to make all this money, so you pay a little up front in order to get the Google kit so that you know the place you've got to click every day and how you do your reporting and everything. Uh, except once you get the kit, that's the last you ever hear from the people who were trying to get a hold of you. Uh, so, yeah, no experience was necessary for that. <laughs> loan intimidation scams. Um, and these aren't loans that you've actually had. These aren't the collectors coming after you. These are people who have gotten some of your personal information. It, I mean, let's face it, it leaks everywhere. We hear every day about a new instance where some companies manage to let their databases get out. And so I am firmly convinced, though I can't prove it yet, that there's a dossier on every single one of us out there. Our social security numbers, our life histories, our credit card numbers, it's all out there. And the whole reason we aren't victims is there's so many of us that can't get through all of us fast enough. <laughs> but. Uh, because feds have had rules for several years now requiring disclosure of these things when they happen. Hmm. If I tell people this happened, my company is going to get in all sorts of, you know, it's going to be a PR nightmare. I'm going to lose my job. Or I can just pretend it never happened, don't tell anyone, and go about my merry life as a low level IT person in this corporation. Hmm. How often do you think that happens? <laughs> uh, yeah, way too many. In fact, universities, we, there was a lot of press a couple years ago about the fact that universities score so high on the security breach scale. And the problem is we're so freaking honest. Um, now, the corporations weren't confessing. We were, and so that gave us a really high number, even though there's, let's face it, not that many universities in the country. Um, so go figure. But I, I, I'm off on a tangent. Let's get back to loan intimidation here. Um, so the whole purpose of this, they've got personal information on you. They start sending you messages saying you've got to pay. You're overdoing your loan. They throw enough information out there for you to think, well, well, this is weird. OK, they have my name. They have my address. They have my phone number. They have my employers. If you don't pay back the money, we're going to tell everyone you're a deadbeat. And think, yeah, you wouldn't do that. Then the boss starts getting phone calls. And eventually, some large percent, some number of people, large percentage is kind of an exaggeration, actually pay the money because they're afraid of the exposure. Because they've got this information, what else can they do to me? The equally scary variation on this one is the escort service intimidation. Um, folks have the same information. They contact you and say, we know you've been using our escort service. We're going to tell your wife. We're going to tell your work. We're going to expose you to everybody. You don't pay because you're, you don't, you've never done that before. They must be mistaken. Nothing's going to happen. Some of those scammers actually build websites where they have your picture. And it's called our deadbeat, our deadbeat list. They, they ran out on their escort service bills. They send you a link to it and say, hey, see what we can do? And you know, once again, folks have a choice of trying to tell everybody they know this really isn't happening, or giving them the hush money and having them go away. And a lot of people do that. Of course, that also means they know that you're a sucker and they can kind of pile on. Probably the most impersonated person in all of spamdom is the uh, director of the uh, <laughs> FBI. Uh, I've lost track of Mueller as even the director anymore, but at least he was for a number of years. And um, yeah, he was one of the biggest emailers at the university on a daily basis. <laughs> uh, hi, we're from the FBI. We've recovered some of your money, but the director of the FBI really, you know, he cares about you and wants to contact you personally. <laughs> All you have to do is go to this website. You'll provide some identifying information so that we can get the money to you. And life is good. Or in a strange twist, yeah, but we can't afford to give you the money unless you pay us the, the finder's fee up front. <laughs> it, it, it goes down roads like that. And it's the FBI. 
The IRS is another popular one because everybody's afraid of the IRS for some reason or another. Um, and you know, they, they hit you on a real visceral level and, and, and even though common sense says that this is nonsense, some percentage of the population falls for it and continues to fall for it because it's as big now as it was in 2005. It's a new one I heard about very recently, which is generating fake utility bills. Now, everybody's moving to online this and online that. Why put your, you know, be green, you know, I'm with uh, BG&E and they tell, they implore me every month to stop getting my paper bills so I can save the environment and save them money um, and go with online billing. They're using the same sorts of scams. They were from the, we're from the utility. We've overcharged you. We're sending you a refund check. In the meantime, we need for you to send something to us so that we can give it to you. Generally, it's information they should have had already. And then once again, you're hooked. So keep an eye out for those fake utility bills. Wi-Fi is the bane of my professional existence. <laughs> Actually, it's the biggest bane. We'll get a few more banes. Um, I got a little story I like to tell. It's kind of the highlight of my career. But that, that's kind of saying something, I think. Um, 2004, 2005 timeline. Um, I'm a much smaller. Right now, I've got a great team of people working for me. The university takes security really seriously now. We do a lot of great stuff. 2005, the security of IT at the entire university rests in the hands of me and my student intern. <laughs> Whoa, we were lucky. Um, one day, we get a knock on our door, and it's uh, Special Agent Friendly. Uh, he's got his badge, and he says, there's some serious badness happening here at the university, and we, uh, we need you to tell us where exactly it's happening so we can slap the cuffs on somebody. Turns out, there's a company, they were getting um, threats, extortion threats, from, well, strangely enough, a person who kept trying to expose who he was to this company, a former employee who felt the company had stolen his patents. But he didn't say who he was, but the company had a good sense of who he was. But they couldn't prove he'd done anything. And all these strange things were pointing back to the University of Maryland <coughs> as the source of this attack, uh, of these threats. So they were very happy. I said, cool, I can find computers for you. They gave me the computer address for it. And I tapped, tapped, tapped for a minute, and I tapped it a little slower and a little slower. And I said, hmm, this belongs to a professor I know in the same building I work in. I know him very well. He doesn't strike me as the extorting type. Um, this is disturbing. <coughs> so we wandered down, and we knocked on the door to talk to to Professor X, and uh, he opened the door, and he said, hi, how you doing? And I looked over his shoulder, and sitting on the ledge in his office was a blue box with blinking lights, um, and a pair of rabbit ears, <laughs> and a line coming out of it plugged into our computer network, and a few other lines going to all the computers in his office, because he's kind of a computer geek. Um, turns out, he bought a box. Back in those days, we charged you for every computer you put on the network, and if you've got a research budget, you don't want to waste your money on IT when you can spend it on cool stuff. So he bought one of those little blue boxes so that he could piggyback several computers in his office and not pay us all the extra money, use it for his research instead. Um, the fact that this thing did Wi-Fi was, it didn't matter to him. He didn't need it. He didn't have any Wi-Fi enabled computers in his office. Again, it's 2005, 2006. But it's there in case he ever needs it someday. And so from the day he plugged it in, it had been radiating the parking lot with our network. And somebody had kind of wandered by and discovered this and was using our network connection to send these threats. I thought, great, how are we going to catch that? The next day, the feds came and they said, ha, the guys are not on that computer anymore. Now we can get them. Here's, here's the address. I said, oh, this one was in one of our auxiliary IT buildings. It's like, hmm, I don't like that. So we went down there. And sure enough, an enterprising employee had decided that he didn't like the fact that he had to have a cord stretched across his office. He liked to sit in his easy chair rather than at his desk. And so he'd installed his own Wi-Fi network there. <laughs> and he had an office adjacent to the parking lot as well. <laughs> Same guy, he had done what many folks had done. 
they drive around with their Wi-Fi open looking for available places to get on the network. In the end, we were lucky. The guy eventually needed something. He needed a Macintosh. He didn't have one. So he wandered into one of our computer labs and started taking pictures of the CEO of this corporation and doing horrible manipulations to it. Arrows through his head and, and all sorts of crazy stuff and sending them to him. It's like, well, oh, really? But feds came back with a new address and said, ah, this is a real computer. And they walked down and, and arrested the guy. The freaky part of it was, it turns out, he was very serious about his extortions. He had been working in his home laboratory on making some toys to enforce things when they didn't see things his way. He had grenades. He had all the pieces necessary to start making rice and nerve agent. And, um, and so they kind of got him, they got that by accident because the guy was silly enough to want to draw funny pictures of that guy's face. Did he work at your university? Not at all. He lived in the adjacent community and he just figured it was a convenient place to go and try and hide his identity. So that was the a bunch of there. And he wound up being in prison for over 10 years. I believe he's just about due to come out soon. So we're really excited about that. <laughs> uh, but, um, and that was pretty cool. And the director of the FBI, he wasn't spamming me this time. I actually got, he had a nice little plaque that said, thank you for helping stopping this horrible criminal. So that's cool. But it kind of, that is one kind of melodramatic example of what happens every day. Because people don't realize that when you slap a Wi-Fi network in your house, and these days it seems like everybody has one, at least when I drive through my neighborhood trying to get on my neighbor's Wi-Fi, <laughs> just to prove points like this. Um, I was accused of being a creepy little dude at a community picnic once because I started explaining it to somebody and they didn't quite take it in the right spirit. Um, but um, in my neighborhood, I've been living in a rural community. Every house is on an acre of land or more. Many of them are set well back from the road. My own house is 100 yards from the road, give or take. And if I'm standing at my mailbox on the street, I can pick up the Wi-Fi signal from my house. We've secured our network, and about 65% of the people in our neighborhood who are using two-thirds, the people in our neighborhood have secured them, but the other third still are wide open. Anybody can use their network. And the bad part about that is, one, you want to do something bad and you want to blame somebody else. Here again, when you do the bad thing, the feds are going to go to their house and say, what did you do? These days, they're smart enough to realize, well, we'll look at the open wireless network, and it may not be as bad as it could have been. But two, you don't have a bad guy on the same local area network as all the computers in your house. And as a result, if any of those computers aren't up to date on their vulnerability patches, you know, Microsoft is still really good about giving us 10 or 20 of those every month so that <laughs> Windows 7 was supposed to be secure, right? That's what I was told. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they can take over your computer that way and do it for whatever they want. So those are some of the problems. Windows 7 is definitely not secure. Uh, in fact, one of our students in Department of Forensic Sciences, one of our uh, high-tech students who actually cataloged this massive uh, vulnerabilities. Oh, yeah. all, all of your passwords are in files that can be accessed. Yep. That's why I'm buying a Mac. Why don't we have public service announcements? Seriously, secure the network. Everybody seems to have them these days. It's a darn good question. I didn't know. It's not, imp it's not important enough to any government agency that's willing to do so. Uh, I've been looking, I don't remember ever seeing airtime bought for such messages. Because it could help cut down on some of the cyber crime. Exactly. And in fact, those bots we're talking about, many of them, you know, the doom and you know, the folks who want to like take the, the internet threat to its extreme, you know, they do the math and say, well, we know that this certain percentage of home computers are compromised already because they never got their patches when they were supposed to, all that sort of thing. That there are millions and millions of computers in homes in the United States that are compromised. There is a, yeah. Good a time now as I say. If there's a virus called the DNS changer, which is probably the most insidious one yet, 
50 million computers around the world are infected, including every single cable box in a couple of South American countries. What this, what this does is very simple. Your computer is configured generally to talk to the computer at your internet provider so that when you want to go someplace in the internet, you say, I want to go to www.apple.com. You tell that to your provider server. It gives, okay, here's the IP address that your computer is going to connect to. Boom, you go. What DNS Changer did was it changed that IP address to an evil server someplace else, which was giving the correct answers. So you, don't, you have no idea that you've got it because if you did, if, you, if they were doing something evil, eventually you'd see something bad happening. But it wasn't being used for bad. I believe this is what they call farming, right? I believe you got the term. That's the right term. I, I haven't heard the term. I've used it, but I think you're right. Um, and so, fortunately, a researcher stumbled onto this thing before it um, was exploited. A friend of mine out in California, who's the president of the Internet Software Consortium, runs a large domain name system infrastructure. And he went to the FBI and said, look, I've got a problem here. People sooner or later are going to wind up in the massive numbers being directed to sites that look like their banks, look like their schools, look like all these things that aren't real unless we do something. And if you just take, because the US government thinks it controls the internet, if you just take all of those addresses and block them, then 75 million people will lose the internet because suddenly they can't look up anything. So the feds and ISC got together and said, we will take those addresses and we will hijack them and give them to ISC, and ISC will give legitimate answers for the next three months. And in the meantime, internet providers will do a good job of figuring out who is infected and getting them fixed. And this is back in the middle of last year. Three months came, three months went, still a problem. The number that had been found has dropped by about a quarter, but there's still a gigantic number. We had, they had to get a court order in order to do this. The court renewed it for three more months and kept renewing it. Now the next renewal date comes up in the middle of July, but eventually they're going to have to stop doing this because the court said they won't do it forever. When that day comes, boom, all the people who still have that configured on their computer will stop being able to get on the internet. The good news around here, at least the major internet providers that service us in this area, Comcast, Verizon, a few others, they are very aware. One of the things ISC has been doing is cataloging who has this and then sending out the information about who has it to the internet providers so they can do something about it and tell people. So in theory, at least, the people in this area, if they have it, they've been told and told how to fix it, but we don't know. It's going to be an interesting day when that finally comes. Mm -hmm. So denial of service extortion, this is a fun one. You've got all those bots we were talking about. You're a, you could buy them, again, on the market. You could buy large ones. You could buy 100,000 of them. And let's say you know a company that really needs internet connectivity for some reason, like, say, an online gambling outfit in the Cayman Islands in the week before the Super Bowl. Who are they expected? They will process millions and millions of dollars worth of wagers, of which, of course, they're getting a service fee on each of them, during that upcoming week. Person running the extortion contacts the offline, offshore establishment, says, hey, we know this is a big deal for you, and if you give us this large sum of money, we will let you do it. And they laugh. <laughs> yeah, right. And so a demonstration is presented to them. From 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, your time, you're going to disappear from the internet just to let you know that we're serious about this. At a given hour, those 100,000 computers are given an instruction. Hit the website of that firm for the next hour. Hit it hard. Hit it as often as you can. The firm's servers are not set up to handle that kind of volume, and they collapse and are not able to respond to any legitimate queries. At the end of the hour, the firm goes, oh. And then they come back 
the bad guys come back and ask for, okay, you saw that, you didn't say okay the first time, so now we need you to give us a little more money, seven-figure number, and uh, the firms pay. And that was uh, happened to two different offshore gaming outfits for the Super Bowl three years ago. Um, the uh, not only do people do that for money, we also we've seen a lot of this with the hacktivists lately. Uh, they take down, they like to say, okay, at 12 o'clock tomorrow, we're going to take down the FBI for an hour just to let them know we're serious and that sort of thing. So we see a lot of that, and all that is facilitated by the fact that people's computers are uh, are uh, compromised. Um, this is the list of the most common 25 passwords found on a set of internet sites whose password files were compromised last year. The FBI put it together. Top 25, kind of, some of them make sense. Password. <laughs> you know, QWERTY, the first six across the top of the keyboard. Uh, QuazWizix is, you know, diagonally QAZWSX. Folks, you know, don't want to do that. All sorts of numbers. The ones I don't really understand too much are Ashley and Bailey. My wife explained to me, well, Jerry, th those are modern. That that's what we're naming our girls these days, apparently. I'm not going to say which one, but I have to go home and change all my passwords. <laughs> <laughs> my work is done here for today. My, go my goal is always if I can reach one person, I've done my job. So thank you very much. Um, now, Ashley and Bailey, apparently that's what people are naming their girls these days. So apparently sons and daughters are common passwords as well. And Ashley, Bailey, and Michael kind of hit the top of the list there. In the past week, LinkedIn. Now, everybody uses LinkedIn these days. It's how you keep track of your professional connections. The password file for LinkedIn was leaked and put it on a website. The good news is they didn't just say, okay, password and Jerry at UMD. But they did publish the hashed form of that, which is simply they take your password, they run it through a mathematical formula to produce a long number. And that number is unique, and they know that if anyone ever types in your password, they're going to get that number back so they can compare that without having to store the actual <laughs> password. Um, turns out that uh, the list was 6 million lines long, so 6 million unique passwords on the LinkedIn site for 150 million people, which says an awful lot of those people have the same password, probably password. The person who put the thing online also they marked the ones they'd already cracked because you could, again, mathematical formulas, you can just take every common word and run it this formula and see what you get. Of the six million, they'd figured out three million already, including mine. Um, well, the message that now, it's LinkedIn. I don't really care too much about LinkedIn until someone takes it and starts friending me with people I don't want to friend, so whatever. But a lot of people use the same password on LinkedIn. They'll use it on their eHarmony dating site, which was also compromised this week. They'll use it for their music service, like Last.fm, which was compromised this week. And suddenly, the bad guys say, you know, maybe his bank has that password. Maybe his home computer has that password. And because is anyone willing to raise their hand and say they've got one password for almost all of their stuff? Yeah, me too. I'm, humans are lazy. And you, you say, OK. These accounts don't matter, but when you start getting 5, 10, 20 of them, suddenly the cross-section of them all do matter because it says a lot about you. The last one, the one I really wanted to get to, and if I could make one more point on folks, Facebook and all these other social media sites, they give you the ability to check in and tell people where you are right now. Um, it's great, as long as you're not telling somebody who is interested in going into your house right now the fact that you're across town, or you're here for the next several hours, or whatever. Combine that, for, Facebook is doing a better job of locking down its privacy. They've got a long way to go, but they've done a little bit. They used to allow you to search based upon geographic region. I could plug in, wash, just, if I just put Washington DC into the search engine, and name of any of the colleges in the region. I would get a long list of hits for people who had been or recently graduated from the universities, worked in the DC area, a strangely large percentage of them being congressional aides. And so I was able to find things like, uh, the boss really tied it on last night, and okay. I, he didn't say who the boss was, but he says he was there, you go elsewhere, you could Google him and figure out and find out those sorts of things. 
I did this for a presentation to a set of high school teachers a couple years ago on the dangers of social media. The second thing I showed them, the more scary one, is just what people do with pictures. This person, and I just did this live for them. A half hour before the presentation, I surfed Facebook, found the perfect example. It showed pictures of the person's home, beautiful, you know, they all the high-tech toys, status, off to California for the holidays. <laughs> Their name was not a particularly common one. Google got a hit, here's their address. You want to make sure they're gone, here's their home phone number. All of this need to connect has, a, if in the wrong hands, has really made it so that people can do us harm. The pictures in particular, I just want to make sure I get that in. Most cameras these days have the ability to, they've got GPSs on them. I took this picture here in Silver Spring. Um, you take pictures of your kids, you've got young kids. Picture your kids, GPS location, if you let it, It'll show right down, you know, the five meter square where that picture was taken. Scary stuff there about, you know, giving people information they might need to know more about you to take advantage of you. So computers, I mean, cameras have the ability to turn that off and unless you really need it, I'd turn that off. So protecting, I'm going to run really quickly through these because I think in the course of the conversation, we've covered a lot of the things to protect yourself. And um, I guess you could actually look at these in depth when we get the video online at YouTube. But for all of these things, the themes are basically the same. And kind of ironic. Be skeptical of everything you see. That's convenient. And, um, and if it's too good to be true, um, it probably is. And uh, again, we've talked about all this, so I don't need to worry about it here. But I want to get to the summary. <laughs> things mom told me. You know, if it's too good to be true, it likely is. And don't take candy from strangers. Uh, with that, folks, I'll take any questions you have. Yeah. Uh, I've been spending, sending spam I get to the FTC. Does that do any good? Did there did spam at with some little number, and they encourage you to send that there? It makes you feel good. <laughs> yeah, that's what uh, the irony these days is that uh, the folks are sending you, by the time you get the spam, Within an hour or two hours of having received the spam, the major internet providers have seen enough of it to catalog it as bad, and the big boxes in the middle of the internet start filtering that stuff out. We have one of those boxes at the university. Every day, 92% of the messages sent to the university are dropped on the floor because they are coming from a source that has been identified as sending spam in the last 24 hours. And that's, that's millions of messages dropped on a daily basis. So, but yeah. The FTC is basically, by the time they get it and do something with it, the industry has already done their thing with it because the timeline of these is hours instead of days and weeks now. Yeah. I have a friend who uh, didn't have much reason to email me very much, but we had each other's email addresses. Mm -hmm. And I would get these emails from her with a blank subject line. And I, I, didn't, I didn't open it. I sent her an email instead and said, did you send me an email with a blank subject line? She said, no. And so I said, I think your thing is infected. She said, oh, dear, I'll have to do something about that. She doesn't have a lot of money. And I still get them. Mm -hmm. Two or three years later, and every couple of months, here comes one from Maddie. Mm -hmm. Last name should be withheld. but And, and there's always a blank subject line. So, mm -hmm. Every third or fourth one, I say, Maddie, it's still going on. Oh, doggone. You know, but anyway, what is likely to have invaded her computer? What's, trying, what's it trying to do immediately? Generally, people ask me, why do I get spam? And it's because your email address is out there. Now, I've had the same email address for 15, 20 years. I've published. I do lots of presentations. I... My email address is all over the internet, and I get several hundred spam a day. Um, but that's me. I'm on the web, and there are folks who crawl. They have programs, just like Google crawls the web looking for information. People write programs to go all over the internet looking for addresses to add to files. Because especially if you could prove that an email address is a working address, it's worth a little bit of money to somebody, especially when you bundle them up in burlap and ship them out in the quantity of 100 or 500. Um, but they also. Get your address by people who are infected that you know. Every, you know. When someone's computer is infected, one of the things they usually do is ship off the address book. 
I mean, it's frightening, the clearing houses they have for these things where all those addresses go into a big mill and then over the course of time they're processed and determine whether or not they're legit or not and added to the list. So that's where people wind up getting targeted. The best way to, she picked up a virus somewhere, an email virus, um, probably because she received an email virus. Antivirus software, it's had seen better days. But in general, we find most of the major brands catch two thirds of the viruses that come through. It's two thirds, that's a big number and a small number all at the same time. Because a lot of them these days, instead of just trying to go in, you open it and it tries to exploit a vulnerability and go into the computer and change settings. It's now very driven towards, hi, we need you to do something. We need you to install something. And they try to trick you into thinking it's legit. Hey, they sent you a video, but you don't have the right driver. The word driver sends chills in the hearts of many people. <laughs> it's a tech word. You need to install a driver in order to see it. Click here to install. Install the driver. They even see the video, but it wasn't a driver. They were installing a virus. The computer popped up and said, hey, you're about to install such and such a program. Are you sure? Yeah, I want to see the video. And boom, <laughs> you're infected. Um, so that's most likely how she got it. Um, because it saves them money, most internet providers actually give away free antivirus software these days to their customers. If you don't have it, you still need it. If you own a Macintosh, you need it now. The, my smug Macintosh friends for the last 10, 15 years have <laughs> said, I got a Mac, I don't get viruses. Last month we had a virus that infected a healthy number of Macs and proved the story wrong. The reason Macs haven't gotten infected, you ship what's this? Okay, I'll finish this first. Um, yeah, the reason that uh, Macs really haven't been targeted isn't that they're any more secure. It's just for the longest time, Bill Gates had the market lead over Steve Jobs, and it was more cost effective to write viruses for PCs than Macs. And I work at a university, you know, Macs are more popular there. We're seeing now students purchase Macs on campus 20 to 1 versus PCs. So we know that's the emerging market. Folks have bought on to now, and so now we're seeing more and more virus writers turning the reference to that. And the antivirus makers for Macintoshes, who for the most part over the years just, if a PC virus passes through your computer on the way to those vulnerable PCs, we'll let you know about it. It's kind of how the old Mac antivirus worked. Now it's actually, hey, something's hitting here, you gotta stop it. So if, if you run a Mac with that antivirus, those days are over. Yes, ma'am. The first time this happened to me, I fell for it a couple of years ago, maybe three years ago, I don't remember exactly. Uh, this message popped up that, you know, you have some infections and blah, blah, blah. We found 403, and I believe that was the number. And, you know, do you want to fix them? And I said, of course I want to fix them. And then they wanted to sell me a program to fix what they did to it. But my husband over here and my son, who is a computer genius <laughs> in New York, seriously, they tried what did you do, a whole day's worth of work, two days worth of work, but he got it all fixed. Just last week, I got that same thing. Mm -hmm. This time, of course, I did not open it. But I, am I safe if I didn't open it? Or the fact that it appeared again, is there some danger? Um, the fact that it popped up on your computer screen means that you were exposed to it. Um, it's worth having your son look at again just to make sure things are still okay. Twice this week, but this time I knew it was the same number, 400. It always is 403 because it's not really antivirus. It is a picture of a screen of antivirus. And you're installing, I mean, when you click the okay, you're installing evil software and it's doing that sort of stuff again. So that's part of the trick. Yeah, I had the same thing just this yeah. morning. Yeah. A very convincing screen telling me that Microsoft Essential, Security Essentials had found something. Yeah. But I checked my own installation of yeah. Security Essentials, and it, it said everything was clean. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, you had mentioned this love scam or whatever. Yeah. A friend of mine uh, taught English in Moldova, and he said one of his students wanted to have an American pen pal to, you know, really take it further. And he happened to mention she was an attractive blonde, and I was glad to, to participate. Anyway. <laughs> so I, she sent me a letter, and I sent it back, and I think the second or third one she sent me, hey, my brother has stomach cancer, we need money. And uh, my friend who had been in Moldova said, wow, it doesn't seem like it would be something she would do, but we, we suspect it was a scam. But anyway, it, this is from the 90s, but it was, the internet wasn't involved at all. It was all postage stamps and airmail and all that. 
Um, listen, I do have a question for you, though. Yeah. Um, 3G, 4G, you know, I'm in sending data somehow <laughs> into the network. Is that risky? It's, I think there's risk in everything we do. Sure. But uh, on, on the scale of risks, it's probably smaller than other things. Your 3G and 4G communications are, to an extent, encrypted with the providers. Um, there's still tricks that can be done, but proximity to you is required. A lot of knowledge about what you're running. I wouldn't consider it a high threat, but kind of in the realm of possibility, along with about a thousand other things that could go wrong. It's a and I will, folks, I'm going to be here for the rest of the day, so if you, the breaks you want to ask more stuff, I'm happy to do so. Yes, a, a variant on the attractive blonde scam <laughs> that someone just <laughs> fell for is getting notes allegedly from your grandchild, from your friend who's overseas, has been robbed, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. please wire money. Yes, and one of our wrong. neighbors, who's a doctor, had a friend of hers get that email and why? And the friend saying that the the neighbor was in London, had been mugged, was penniless, needed money, and wired two or three thousand dollars overseas. The neighbor was horrified, but the money was gone. Just as you've said, once you wire it, that's the last you're yeah. going to see of it. And that's just another variation of sending something that looks plausible. And and just one observation on the email without a subject line: it's so easy to spoof where email is coming from. Just as you were saying about it comes from the director of the FBI, that may not be coming from your friend. They may have captured her email address. They're sending out email from Moldova saying that it's from her. I get bounces claiming that email that I sent to an invalid address has bounced. I didn't send it, but they're spoofing my address to send out this email. And so she really may not, she may, really may not be infected. Yep. Curious, was your neighbor overseas or was your neighbor? No, no. We had an incident at the university two or three years ago where a student from one of the offices on campus was doing a study abroad semester in a foreign country. And the people in that office received that message supposedly from their student overseas. And so that was even more plausible. I mean, somebody, um, what, it's scary, especially, well, it's just about everywhere now. When you're traveling, you're very exposed. It's very easy for people to pick up on stuff you're doing, either through going into a cyber cafe or a vulnerable wireless network, whatever. Somebody figured out she was overseas, worked at the university, and said, hey, this is a scam we can run. They got our email address, and boom. And then we had to hold them by the ankles and don't, don't do anything <laughs> until they were able to finally get a hold of somebody and corroborate that there was nothing wrong with her. Is that that's very true? Yes, sir, you're last, I guess. When you, when you run into these scams, your, your, your people get scammed and whatnot, and uh, there's a variety of crimes. Will you call, will you call the FBI, and if so, do they cooperate with you? And well, they, uh, I am on a very good base, first name basis with most of the agents at the FBI office in Baltimore, which is the office of the jurisdiction of a college park. Um, in general, if they can lump that incident with other ones like it, because of the number of crimes they have, I mean, they're drowning. Um, unless they can get a, reach a certain dollar amount of loss, um, the U.S. attorney won't even consider dealing with it. So if it's a one-off, they're just going to be more sorry about that. If, it's, if they've heard about it a bunch of times, they can add that to a list, then they'll pay more attention to it. But there's so much computer crime. There's such a backlog. There's a dearth of computer professionals in the computer security field still after all these years um, that uh, you know, they're lucky if they can handle the casework for serious crime, you know, murders, uh, armed robberies. And of course, they put a lot of energy into child exploitation. If it's, if it's anything else, then they got to make a dollar decision on whether, what to do with it. I wonder, that explains it because I, I, I was a victim intended victim of a scam. I got to the point where I was supposed to go to my bank and take $1,800 in cash and get it to a, get it to a guy who'd be there. Mm -hmm. And I called the FBI in Baltimore. I said, I have, to have a couple agents there to arrest the guy. And they wouldn't do it. Yeah. it was, I said, this is a slam dunk case. You know, <laughs> they wouldn't do it. Uh, there's always, sometimes you have better luck with the local police. Um, I know the university police force, they're giddy to do computer stuff these days because they've just been trained. They got a grant from the Secret Service. They want to try out everything they know. <laughs> um, 
but um, but yeah, it, it, if if the FBI blows you off, if they get a pretty high threshold because of their 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 coverage. You might get more interest at a local level. They can identify a local state crime that's been committed in that. Grace is creeping. Thank you. Thank you all very much.